word. We pray that uh, we would apply and interpret your word as you call us to do so. And I pray that you would um, impress upon us the massive weight uh, of, of, of your word, not as a means of uh, a discouragement or repression, rather, but that we might uh, be impacted all the more as we live out our freedom through the Spirit, uh, in the Spirit through Christ. And I ask that we grow as a result of this time together all the more. Jesus, amen. Let me see you. Amen. Just remind you that if you were looking for, if you're one of the three people that use the outline, uh, that it is in the, if you're looking for it, hold open, open your, your bulletin, it's on the back. So, yes, as Shirley is beautifully waving her around back there. So, if you're looking for it. If you didn't even know there was an outline, and then we actually gave you one. Well, don't even have to worry about it. Good afternoon. Uh, what better occasion than for me to stand here preaching the Word of God and for you to hear and apply the Word of God to your lives? I like to remind us of that at times, just so that we are fully aware of the freedom that we have to sit here, fully aware of the weight of God's glory through His Word as is an active and living uh, uh, and dwelling. There are a lot of things in life that are not worth fighting for. That we know. There are many things in life that are not worth fighting for. Um, it's not worth fighting for a parking spot. It's not worth fighting for who has the right of way or driving. Right. It's not worth fighting for. Um, over the chances of, of the Canadians winning the Stanley Cup this year, let alone getting past Ottawa. <laughs> However, there are many things in life worth fighting for. We don't preach pacifism, only appropriate, responsible, accountable pacifism. Although we do fight for things, we fight for our freedom that's honorable. We fight for our families. We fight for our careers. We fight for uh, that which is right. We fight for justice. We fight for many things. And let me suggest to you that the greatest thing, I thought about this, because I can really use um, such a, a sensational word as the greatest thing. I think I can. The greatest thing you and I can be fighting for on this earth, this side of eternity, is our sanctification. Our sanctification. We know that for those who receive Christ as Savior, we are saved. We have been positionally sanctified. We have been made righteous. We have been justified. We have been placed from here into the presence of God. But yet, we are still called to be sanctified and to, to act out that salvation, to act out of that sanctification. And so we fight. If you thought the battle with sin, the battle with the flesh, and the devil ended at salvation, you were wrong. It almost began there. An increased, uh, intensified battle began at salvation as we fight for our continual sanctification. It's like a paratrooper. World War II paratrooper being dropped to enemy lines, behind enemy lines, and it's as soon as they hit the ground, they are in the fight. And it's as soon as we are saved and set apart for the glory of God, that you and I begin to fight. 
Now, before we get into our passage, before uh, we jump down, uh, skip a few verses, I'm going to explain here the, the construct of what Paul says so we have a better understanding of why we're the verses we're in and what the context is. So give me one minute as I explain that. Open up your Bibles to Romans 7, as Anne read in verse 6. So verse 6 is really the subject line, if you will. Verse 6, Paul says, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. For weeks, for months, we've been talking about the code, the, the, the old law, the old covenant mediated by the law versus the new covenant mediated by Christ now in the Spirit, through the Spirit. And so Paul says this in verse 6, and if you were to break it down into three subsequent sections, you could take verse 7 to 14, and he qualifies the law. He explains a little bit. He, he gives a better explanation of his position, his view of the law. That the law is not bad. The law is, in fact, good, but just abused and no longer necessary. That's verses 7 to 14. Verses 15 to 25, we see the battle of the flesh. So verse 6, he says... You've been set apart, you've been saved, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, you've been made righteous. Qualifies the law a little bit, but then gets into, but there's a battle being waged. And this is what I'm saying. And then, in chapter 8, verses 1 to 8 and 1 to 9, he continues to explain what life in the Spirit looks like. And so what we're going to do, we're going to jump down to verse 15 to 25. And actually, we're not going to get past verse 21 today. And kind of two part, uh, part one of a two-part series looking at the reality of the battle of the flesh. The reality of the battle of the sin. The reason I'm doing that is because you may or may not remember when we're in chapter 3, I actually skipped ahead to uh, chapter 7, verses 7 to 14, to, so we better, we better understand the law. Okay, so I'm not going to, uh, for the sake of, uh, I'm not being redundant. We're going to skip that part since we've already looked at that uh, and head over down to verse 15 to, uh, to verse 21. <coughs> but what I first want to understand, just to kind of lay a foundation before we even get into the battle with the flesh, lay again the foundation of the new covenant through in the Spirit. The new covenant in the Spirit. If you remember, I gave an illustration last week. I'm not going to give it again. But basically, you have the old covenant that has been given, was given to man, mediated by the law to prepare man for the new covenant in Christ, mediated by the Spirit. So I gave that illustration of the man being given a pass and a pill, a pill ingesting him, a pill to ingest, and a pass giving him access to God. And the assistant not being Christ. Okay? You have to go back, you have to listen to the past messages to get that. But the idea was that the old covenant, mediated by the law, was to prepare the hearts of the people of God for the new covenant, mediated by the Spirit, made possible through Christ. Okay? And this new covenant now is now a covenant in the Spirit, through the Spirit. This was nothing new for the Israelites. In fact, this was prophesied by uh, prophets of old. Jeremiah 31. Verse 31 to 33. If you flip back, Jeremiah 31. Just kind of give you a couple of proof texts here to help you understand how Israel would have seen this, this new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay. So the old one will pass away. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. New covenant. A new covenant, not mediated by the law, but a new covenant mediated by the Spirit of God that will be uh, and that will indwell them. 
Notice that the terminology of being within. Okay, we see the same thing in Ezekiel 11. Okay, flip over a couple verses. Ezekiel 11, verse 19. Page 699. If you have the Pew Bible. Talking about the new covenant, he says, And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put again within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. So what we see, we see a little bit of a difference here. See, as the law, the law was an external pressure placed on them, attempting to change them, but rather the new, and the new covenant by the spirit was now an, an, an internal pressure moving from the inside out. That they, would, that they would glorify God by internally, by the Spirit, having an external manifestation. Rather than an external pressure that as the law being dictated to them, now it would be placed within them. And then we're going to look at what that means, what that looks like later on next week. But it's a beautiful concept. It's a beautiful concept, but we need to understand what exactly that means. So basically, for the New Testament saint, we understand that we have the Spirit of God placed within us, indwelling us. The Spirit of God indwelling us. Okay? Now, what that doesn't mean, that very concept is, is a beautiful concept, a wonderful concept, a concept that we often take, we too often take for granted, so we're going to look at it next week. But there are two poor doctrines that result in this abuse of this covenant. And one would be that of perfectionism. That somehow we have been perfected. We no longer have to deal with sin. We no longer have to deal with that which plagued us before. And so we've now already been glorified. We've been perfected. And so we just sit back and enjoy the working, the outworking, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit within us. What does that do? That breeds a lackadaisical Christianity, doesn't it? All of a sudden we have, we have uh, placed Jesus in the driver's seat. We have said, okay, now you take it and you really just kick back as if it's an autopilot and you have absolutely nothing. And then when the vehicle careens out of control off a cliff, you wonder what in the world happened. I let go and let God, and now my life is a complete wreck, and I am neck deep in sin. How in the world did that happen? That happened because you thought that because you are a new creation, right? Second Corinthians 5:17. That you were made a new creation, that somehow everything was doing there, the battle with sin was no longer over, so you let your guard down and Satan nailed you. And then you wonder what happened? Why did God let me down in such a way? He didn't let you down at all. Somehow you had it in your mind that the fight was over, but the fight had just begun. And so that's what we see here. That's where we are now. And so Paul is about to explain. He's just painted this beautiful picture of, of being free. Being free from the law. And, and, and being now, uh, having the, the spirit placed within us. But he says, oh, but there's still a fight. There's still a battle with sin. There's still a battle with the sin, the flesh, and the devil. And it's real. As Israel was wandering through the desert for 40 years, they were on the way to the promised land, right? They were on their way. And what a wonderful thought that was. And they were excited. They would have been excited, but they knew after they already warned that it would be wanting for 40 years, so they weren't there yet. There would be a time when all would be made well, but they weren't there yet. They knew there was a lot of wandering they'd have to do. And a lot of heartbreak they'd have to do. Sometimes I think the saints of old had it better than we do as far as their understanding of the battle of sin. And if you may have, have grown up in church and have had that wonderful privilege growing up in church, you would have sang Onward Christian Soldier. Some of you, just by that mention, already have the tune in your head. The saints of old knew that they weren't done yet. Onward Christian soldiers says, Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe forward into battle. See his banners go. 
At the sign of triumph, Satan's host doth flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Christians, lift your voices loud, your anthems of praise. It's talking of that battle for the same. Another old, uh, line of the old Methodist hymnal says, And none, O Lord, listen here, and none, O Lord, has perfect rest. And none, O Lord, has perfect rest, for none is wholly free from sin. And they who faint would serve thee best are conscious most of all of men. What do they say? They're not contradicting what Paul was saying about being free. They understood that they are made free, positionally free, but they are not free from the presence of sin. They are not free from the temptations of sin. And so what they're saying is the ones who would serve God all the more are those that are fully aware of their own wretchedness. They're fully aware of the presence of sin and the, the predatorial nature that sin carries with it. Paul did this. Paul did this. He told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. He didn't tell Timothy, Timothy, now is your vacation. Now is the time you can kick back and just relax and be a pastor and enjoy this. There's no more temptation once you've come to Christ. He says, no, 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 no. In fact, get ready to fight. It's a good fight. It's a good fight, but it's a fight nonetheless. Making sure he's fully aware of what he's getting into. And if you don't believe me, listen again. Paul says, as Paul echoes what we've all sung, what we've all claimed and proclaimed from time to time, he says this, back to chapter 7, verse 15, I'm going to read it for you again, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I, I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil it lies close at hand. Dr. Seuss book. It's hard to follow. No one read. Now, there are interpretations to this passage that Paul is referring to the, 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 the pre-conversion individual. That, that this is what Paul's describing himself pre-Christ. And therefore describing the nature of the person before they came to Christ. But I don't believe that's the case. Most theologians and most interpreters don't see it. They see this as Paul echoing that which he's currently going through and echoing the sentiment that those who are in Christ are still going through. This is the battle that still wages in. This is the battle that they are still involved in. Now, there's a few reasons for that. I won't get into all of them now. But a few reasons, one of the reasons, if we see in Romans 6.12, we see what Paul tells us. Paul says this in Romans 6.12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So he's talking to who? Christians. And so the very fact that he's saying don't let it reign in your mortal bodies leads me to believe that it's very possible that sin could reign in their mortal bodies despite their position in Christ. Why would he say don't let it reign in your bodies if it wasn't at all possible that it could reign in their bodies? He wouldn't. That's like me saying uh, don't go out in the sun for a prolonged period of time because you could get a sunburn. If the possibility of you never getting a sunburn was never there, I wouldn't tell you that to begin with. I say, you be careful when you go outside and get a sunburn. I'm like, because it's possibly possible you get a sunburn. What Paul's saying. Also, the, one of the reasons we see this to be the, the, the current Christian, something they go through, is the very fact that we understand that and what Paul's saying, especially in Romans 1 32, that it's completely, it's not really possible. There is that internal conflict for the non Christian because the Holy Spirit's not there. They can really do whatever it is they really want to do. See, my conflict with Christ, my conflict comes because I want to do what the flesh wants to do, but the Holy Spirit within says, don't do that. That doesn't bring glory to God. That is not righteous. 
so there's that battle within. If I didn't have the spirit withdrawing and dwelling within, I could do a whole lot of stuff. And so there wouldn't be that conflict. I could give in to just about anything I wanted to get into because I have that spirit within. I'm stopped from doing what I really want to do. Paul's saying the non-Christian doesn't have that internal conflict like the saint does. And thirdly, we understand that when Paul's writing all his epistles, he's writing it uh, with the assumption that those, that the recipients of these letters are those who have already been justified. They've already been saved. And so he continues to remind them to be holy, to act holy. Why? Because it's completely possible that they don't live out that which they are in Christ. As we understand this to be the saint, those that have been justified, that there is that map. Now, what is Paul not saying here? Paul's not condoning or justifying sin. Paul's not doing that. The casual reader could read this, or the, the nominal Christian, the Christian must excuse their sinful behavior. They'll read this and say, see, even Paul dealt with this, so you know what? I, I do my best. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And so when you fall into sin, you know what? I'll just try harder next time. Tomorrow, today I lost. Tomorrow, maybe I'll have victory over sin. See, Paul is saying that sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses, so really isn't that really big of a deal. That's not what he's saying. Can you imagine the general of an army telling his troops, you know what? Sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose. When you go out there to the battlefield, you may just lose. But we'll just pick ourselves right back up and we'll try again tomorrow. Not at all. What's he going to say? You will win. We will win. We refuse to lose. You see the difference? There's a big difference. One leads to a lackadaisical approach to sin. The other leads to a... Uh, Those that like to win over sin will lose from time to time more than they want. Those who refuse to lose will die fighting. You see, what makes good athletes, professional athletes, are those that love winning. But what makes great athletes are those that hate losing. Difference. I enjoy winning. I like to go out there, and if I don't win, oh well, I'll try again next time. But if I go out there and say, I refuse to lose, well, that's a whole other thing. I remember reading an interview with LeBron James, one of the great basketball stars of today. He says, Every defeat, uh, uh, how he said basically, uh, it bothers me continually. Hates losing. Not that everybody loves winning, but the great ones hate losing. You see, Paul here is in turmoil. You say, Paul, I'm getting lighten up a little bit. No, 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 no. He is in complete turmoil. That he would dare give himself in his flesh over to sin. And he hates it. He's in complete turmoil of what sin does. What he's not doing either is minimizing. Uh, the, the, the tenacity of sin. He's not minimizing the tenacity of sin. He's painting it in its appropriate picture. Right? He's calling it an evil lying close at hand. He's, a, he, he's describing this predatorial beast that is just waiting to devour him. So he says, oh, I hate it. I hate it. It's always there. Every time I turn, it's there. It's there. It's serious. As I was preparing for this, I sometimes I'll, I'll reference great sermons of old. When I mean sermons of old, I mean sermons of old. Some of the great theologians that come before us, one of the greatest theologians that has ever come before us is Jonathan Edwards. I referenced him before. Jonathan Edwards, uh, basically 300 years ago, wrote a sermon in September. And, and, and uh, Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest minds, not just of Christian minds, but, but American minds that, ever, that the states have ever produced. He was a great statesman. I think he was by the age of eight or nine. He was in the university. He was the president of Princeton uh, at the time. 
of his death. He, he was a scientist, he was a statesman, he was a philosopher, he was a theologian, he was a pastor, a preacher. Hugely involved in the Great Awakening going up and down the East Coast, the colonial America at the time. And, and 300 years ago, he wrote a sermon, many sermons, and one of these sermons was on sin and was on the battle with sin. What does John Edwards have to say? This is what he said. I'm, I'm going to reference him a few times here. Now it's a little older English, but please bear with me. Understand, hang on what he's saying, because what he's saying it has it, it, he says it much, he says it greater than I can ever say it. This is what he says about the reality of sin, the depiction of sin. He depicts sin as an arrow. He says, they have, those that are in the uh, battle with the sin, they have, as it were, an arrow sticking fast in them, which causes grievous and continual pain, and an arrow which they cannot shake off or pull out. The pain and anguish of it drinks up their spirit, saps them. That's, what, that's exactly what Paul is describing. This, this sin that just saps him and leaves him completely weary. He says, their worldly enjoyments were that were sufficient good before, but they are not now. They wander about with wounded hearts, seeking rest and finding none, like one wandering in a dry and parched wilderness under the burning, scorching heat of the sun, seeking for some shadow where he may sit down and rest, but finding none. Wherever he goes, the beams of the sun scorch him, where he seeks some fountain of cool water to quench his thirst, but finds not a drop. He is like David in his trouble, who wandered about the wilderness to another, from one mountain to another, from one cave to another, giving him no rest. Edwards goes on later to, to depict this same situation as, as the Israelites being pursued by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He's describing this battle with sin. A fierce battle with sin. And so there are a couple questions that, that really need to be asked and really need to be answered. It, it, if we're really thinking through this seriously, one of the questions is, what does that look like? What does that look like when the saint loses the battle with sin? So you say, Brad, can I understand that there's a reality of the battle with sin? There is a battle. So what happens when sin overtakes us for a prolonged period of time? What does the saint look like? Edwards gets into that. He describes it this way. This is a little bit long excerpt, but again, stay with me here. He says this, but many Christians meet with a great deal of darkness on account of the sin. So once they're engaged in the sin, there's a darkness there. And see times in which their hopes are much clouded. They have no hope. Sometimes the sweet and comfortable influences of God's spirit are withdrawn. God's spirit are withdrawn. They were want to have spiritual discoveries made of God and Christ to their souls, but now they have none. Their minds seem to be darkened and they cannot see spiritual things as they have done in times past. Formerly when they read the scriptures, they used often to have to light come in and they seem to have an understanding and relish for what they read and were filled with comfort, but now when they read, it is all a dead letter and they have no taste for it and are obliged to force themselves to He's describing the same that forces their way through the Word of God. They open up the Word of God. What used to be a sweetness, a sweet taste for them, they now find more enjoyment in the Word of God. It's nothing but a dead letter to them. It wasn't always like that. He continues, for they used to have passed through scriptures come to their minds when they were not reading, which brought much light and sweetness with them. The, the verses would come flooding back to them because they were so immersed in it, but those verses that used to encourage them, they don't come anymore. Formerly, they used to feel the sweet exercises of grace. They could trust in God and could find a spirit of resignation to His will and had loved, uh, and had loved drawn forth in sweet longings after God in Christ and a sweet complacence in God, but now they're dull and dead. They used to relish in the grace of God and their relationship with God. They, when they relished and they took joy and delight in it, but not anymore. Their senses have been deadened and they don't feel that joy anymore. 
Formerly they used to meet with God in the ordinance of his house that is at church. But now they're dog dead. Um, it was sweet to sit and hear the word preached and it seemed to bring light and life with it. They used to feel life and sweetness in public prayers and their hearts were elevated in singing God's praises. But now it is otherwise. Before the battle of sin, before sin overtook them, they came to church and they delighted in the singing before God. And they delighted in, in hearing the word of God preached and they were elevated and they, they, they were elevated by it and they took joy in it, but not anymore. Formerly they used to delight in the duty of prayer. The time which spent in their closet between God and their own souls was sweet to them. But now when they go thither, they do not meet God and they take no delight in drawing near to God in their closets. When they do pray, it seems to be a mere lifeless, heartless performance. They utter such and such words, but they seem to be nothing but words. Their hearts are not engaged. Their minds are continually wandering, going to and fro after one vanity and another. With this decay of the exercise of grace, their hope greatly decays the evidence of their piety. This is the state of the saint that has been overwhelmed by sin. He likens it to Psalms 42, 7, where David says, Deep calls out to the deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your ways have gone with me. I am inundated by sorrows. It is a God has just overwhelmed him with life. And there is a hopelessness there. This is the state of the saint when they are overwhelmed by sin and engaged in sin. Which leads us to the second and last question. What caused this? What caused this battle to begin with? What caused this battle with sin? What caused this, the, the, this fight that goes on and on and on at times in the, the lives of the saints? And he says simply, it is sin. But he explains it, he qualifies it. It's easy to say, well, it's just sin. Repent and go about your merry way. No, he says it's sin, but he then goes on to qualify it in three different ways. And I'm going to explain to you what each of those three different ways are. He says it's sin. He says, first, it is the strength of remaining corruption. It is the strength of remaining corruption. In other words, the, the, the saint, the sinner turned saint, it continues to battle with the with that which they were battling before. And the seriousness of it, there will be those that are Christians that were battling much greater demons than others before. And there's a strength there that continues. Okay, for Paul, this is exactly where Paul was. Paul was battling, I believe, because of what Edwards is saying here about it being the strength of remaining corruption. See, for Paul, it was the law. And he even says it. He's going to say, we're going to get to the next week. It's the law that he struggled with. He says, do I want that, that, that law that keeps haunting me? See, Paul knew the law better than anybody knows the, the law that Paul continued to worship before. He was deep into it before Christ. He was deep into the law before Christ. See, others just submitted to it and they were excited about the law, but no, Paul worshiped the law. He was all about the law. So when he came to Christ, the, the strength of this constant struggle continued on. You can, if I was to illustrate that concept, what Edwards is, ex, is communicating, I would explain it this way. There are those that are, that are, are, are serious athletes. Right? That when they stop doing whatever they're doing, let's say you take a, a, an intense runner, right? and they stop running, they have joint pains. And, and, and for some runners, the more they did it, the more athletic they were, the more they're going to have joint pains. And the longer those joint pains are going to, to, to subsist, only be, or last, only because of the intensity with which they trained before. They will subsist and they will minimize. They will be blunted by time's effect, but it will take time. So there are Christians still battling the same demons that they were battling before, but only because it was so intense. Then, he says there's another reason. He qualifies it another way. He said that which is, for those, the reason that you're in constant battle with the, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, while well, you're in constant battle with sin, is because there's constant sin, current sin now. He says there, there's current sin now, and, and that's why you're battling. Because you're involved with it now. So that's how you take the same runner. He's got joy pains, but he continues to run, exacerbating it, making it worse. 
So there's current sin in your life. So somebody said, and many Christians are going to be, yeah, I got stumping on you. Well, maybe it's because you're still sinning. I'm constantly fighting this. That's because you keep engaging in it. It's not rocket science. Right? It's like the patient that goes to the doctor, why do I do this? Well, don't do that. There's, the, there's one last. See, up until this point, I was with Edwards. I still am. But I, I thought, okay, um, the battles that I fight, he didn't really qualify. He didn't really name mine. I was, I was never a good Christian at home. I accepted Christ. I never understood the gospel. I was at a very young age. And there were times that, yes, I, 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 I vacillated in my faith, but but I never had this, this rough against life, but there are some, so my, the, the battles that I have with sin is it's not on account of the, the continuing struggle and strength of sin before. It's not necessarily a battle of this, this egregious current sin that I'm engaged in now, so why is it? Uh, then he came to his third point, which hit most of us right in the eyes. Right in the eyes. This is the third reason. It is how he says it. Darkening of the mind by corrupt frames and evil habits. The darkening of the Christian's mind by corrupt frames and evil habits. When he talks about frames, that's old English, your, your frame of mind, right? your perspective on things. Okay? So it's not that, that egregious sin that, that dogged you before that you right? It's not that, that major current sin that you're involved with now. No, 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 no. See, the reason you're battling with sin now is because of this darkening of the mind by corrupt frames, that perspective, that frame of mind and evil habits. He explains. I end with this concept, so, so hang with me here. So that you can share in the same conviction. He says this. He goes on to qualify these. He says, sometimes they grow proud and conceited of themselves. Either on account of their own godliness and the good opinion that others have of them, or on some other account. He says, sometimes they fall into a worldly frame, and spiritual things grow more tasteless to them. And their hearts are desperately bent on the acquisition of worldly goods. Their heart is no longer in pursuit of spiritual things, it's now in pursuit of something else the acquisition of goods or that which is worldly. He says, sometimes their minds grow light and vain, and their affections are wholly fixed on the vanities of youth, undress, and gaiety and fashion. Right? The world. It's no longer fixed on, on the things of righteousness. It's now fixed on the things, the, the flighty, useless, superficial things of the world. Some because their minds are not occupied as once they were with spiritual enjoyments and delights, sweetly meditating on heavenly things, breathing and longing after them and earnestly seeking them, become the slaves of their sensual appetites. Others grow contentious and quarrelsome. Others fall into a discontented, fretful, and patient frame. So some of you may say, why is it that I keep battling with this sin? It's because you have fallen into this contentious spirit. This, this angry spirit. Quarrelsome spirit. You're constantly discontent. You are constantly fearful. And then at that point, it is you develop habits to support that frame. I would encourage you. Take the time to pray. Say, God, convict me. Convict me of my, my frame of mind. Convict me of my bitterness. Convict me of my quarreling spirit. Convict me of my pride. Convict me of my anger. Free me from this battle that continues to rage on. Pray that. Pray that regularly and see what God does. See what God does. You see, when we become a Christian, it's as though we are placed in a boxing ring. And the fight starts. Now, the difference is, we've already, Caleb, the opponent, we've already won. But we're still forced to fight. We still must fight for sanctification, for that continued holiness before God. 
We don't fight for our salvation anymore. That was done on the cross. You couldn't have earned that, gained that. But we still fight. And in Rocky II, it's been a little while since I've used the illustration. Maybe a few weeks. And I end on this. Rocky's in the hospital. He's been training. But he doesn't have the support of his wife at all. Right, so he's training to be with Paul and Ray. He, he just had a new baby boy, boy. He goes to his wife. He says, listen, to that. And his, you know, Sylvester Stallone, the really bad Italian accent. He says, I don't have to.